Et bonjour à tous, je suis Grégory Guitard du journal du Coin et aujourd'hui un nouvel épisode de podcast en compagnie de Darius Tabatabé de Vertex Labs. Donc on va, comme d'habitude, vous commencez à avoir l'habitude, on va reprendre avec lui sa découverte des cryptos, qui il est, qui nous présente un petit peu ce qu'il fait chez Vertex. Tout ça se passe en anglais, donc activez les sous-titres s'ils ne sont pas déjà activés d'office. Et donc, je passe à l'anglais et on commence tout de suite. Hi Darius, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Oh, I'm fine too, thank you. Yeah, so yeah. Darius, it's really a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Today, uh, we're going to discuss a lot of things. We're going to discuss your, of course, your personal background. We're going to discuss Vertex Labs and what you're doing there. And of course, a lot of other subjects, the trading yeah. ecosystem and things like that. So yeah. maybe to start, just to explain to the audience who you are and what you're doing at Vertex, because I think that you have a very long story of working as a trader or in trading firms in general. So how did you find crypto? And uh, let's yeah. start with that. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm co-founder of Unlimited Technologies, which is the development house building Vertex. The Vertex protocol is a trading protocol on Arbitrum, and our aim is to have uh, centralized exchange type experience, but decentralized custody and kind of all the bells and whistles you'd expect of an on-chain protocol. So we launched a couple months ago and we're doing between 50 and 100 million dollars of volume a day. We just went over a couple billion of dollars total volume and things are going quite nicely. So that's great. So my background is in trading. So I started off as a options trader in FX. So I was a currency option trader for about four or five years. Um, and then I ended up running uh, metals businesses at a couple of large investment banks, Credit Suisse and Bank of America, before working at a hedge fund for five years. And whilst the hedge fund, I was trading crypto PA. So I was quite early on BitMEX. I was trading like cash and carry on BitMEX and mm -hmm. doing some arbitrage strategies there. And then from then, I kind of drifted in and out until about two and a half years ago, sort of made the decision to go full time on crypto and jumped in and initially was trading, but then decided to move to the builder side. And here we are today. <laughs> yeah, okay, got it. Super. And maybe from your personal experience, how do you think that the two markets, the TradFi and the, the crypto ecosystem compare? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of parallels. People in crypto often tend to think they're kind of reinventing the wheel or it's a brand new thing. I think where things are a bit different in crypto is a very disaggregated ecosystem. It'll tend to be in TradFi. If you're trading bonds, say there'll be one active market for each bond or same thing with FX. You have a certain... Well, FX is a bit different where you actually have a range of venues you can trade on. It's probably the one that's most similar to crypto. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to like commodity shares, uh, fixed income, there tends to be one venue as the main place where people trade. So coming over to crypto, the nice thing was in TradFi, everything is kind of squeezed within an inch of its life. You know, you've got the biggest players in the world playing for maximum stakes. And that means that liquidity and competition is really, really intense. In crypto, I think what you find is because there's so many little pots of cash all around different ecosystems, different exchanges, different blockchains. Um, there's often, I think that's why you have so many HFT firms. There's so many places you can find edge. Yeah. So even as an amateur retail, people can come in and find places to make money. I think mm -hmm. that's been really exciting for that space. Okay, super. So as you mentioned, Vertex is a very new application. So most of our audience, I think, probably doesn't know what it is exactly. So you, you mentioned the fact that it was a new decentralized exchange platform on Arbitrum. Uh, maybe let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, what are you offering on Vertex? Yeah, so I think when you look at the decentralized exchange space, one of the major problems we felt was when you come in, you have to trade. If you want to do spot, you might go to Uniswap. If you want to do perpetuals, you might go to DYDX. If you want to figure out how to move around some of your balance sheet, you might go to Arbe. And all these places had different places and you spend gas every time. You got to loop your cash from one place to another. Mm -hmm. It's really complicated. It was very expensive. And it was just bad UX. People didn't like it. Yeah. And we felt that there was an opening to link all these things in one place. So we have a money market, spot, and perps all in one place you trade. Um, that means that doesn't mean much on its own, but what it means from a UX standpoint is you can come and deposit RAP BTC, ETH, USDC, um, 
Arbitrum tokens and we'll add other collaterals. You can use those to LP and then you can use that LP as collateral and come and trade perps on a number of different markets. So as we grow, we'll grow the number of collaterals, we'll grow the number of markets, but basically you can come and trade all those things in one place. And then you can also earn tokens on our token program. So you can become part of the kind of ownership and governance of the exchange by being an early adopter and trader. So this kind of all these things that you don't really get on any other decentralized exchange or centralized exchange at the moment. So we think there's an opening there for people to have that more fluid trading experience. Okay, maybe we will discuss the governance side just after, but let's say for now, I, I read that when users so deposit assets on Vertex, they can, for example, automatically earn yield. What is the, the yield like and where does it come from exactly? So at the moment, the yield's fairly low. I can actually check in real time and see where we are. So yeah. deposit rates for RAP BTC are around 0.6%. Uh, the borrower rates around 2.5%. On Arbitrum, it's roughly similar. Um, and then RAP DETH and USDC are fairly low. About mm -hmm. 10 basis points to deposit and 1.3% to borrow. And basically, those deposit rates are generated by traders who borrow to trade spot. So if you want to do leverage spot, it's very similar to looping, say, on Aave. Instead of looping on Aave, you just do it kind of automatically through our money market. You can get like leverage long or short, whatever spot market you want. So in our case, it's the ETH ARB. And then the system takes care of the rest. So your deposits are earning from lending to those people who are shorting to yeah. the token you're earning. And since it comes from the loans, how does Vertex make sure that lenders never lose money? Yeah, because so, we we saw so over decentralized uh, protocol uh, that were uh, subject to uh, liquidation cascades or things like that. So, how are you uh, protecting uh, yourself from that? So our loans are all over collateralized. So our system kind of deals with everything at once. But you can kind of think of it as if we take a haircut or over collateralize, depending how you, which way around you do it. But on ETH loans, it's around ninety percent collateral. On Arbitrum, it's more like eighty five percent. Mm -hmm. Rapid TC is like 90%. So we have like a liquidation process. If you get to your maintenance margin requirements, you get liquidated. And so the whole system is over collateralized, basically. We always hold more assets than liabilities at any one time. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Super. Maybe we could also discuss about your pricing data system. I don't know how it is working. Uh, what's your Oracle? Yeah. So we use an oracle called Stork, which is a mm -hmm. relatively new oracle, but the advantage that Stork gives us is they're able to deploy markets very, very quickly, and they come in on a very high performance basis. So that means that we can run a very active liquidator set, mm -hmm. uh, and it means that, again, it's another way of like keeping the market safe in very fast markets. So you talked about liquidation cascades. The problem with like liquidation cascades is crypto tends to be that positions build up in one direction or another. You just kind of have to accept that that's the thing that happens. But what you want is that the liquidators can operate very, very quickly. If the market's moving quicker than the liquidators can operate, then you start to run into real problems. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be on high performance exchanges, not an issue. Where you do run into an issue is maybe where you have a lot of on-chain liquidity or somewhere where like the server has problems. I know BitMEX had some issues a couple of years ago. So the issue we're always looking for is can we build in a lot of redundancy into our backend? And also, can we have oracles that operate at very high speed and be reliable? And, and that's kind of what Stork gives us. Okay, okay, super. And do you plan on using more oracles in the future? Yeah, it's something we talk about. So candidly, yes, we'll probably add more oracles at some point. It's just a matter of getting bandwidth for the Eng team. You know, we push a lot of product, so it's just getting to it is the main issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, another subject is about the, the universal margin uh, that is useful, but some people want to use uh, isolated margin sometimes. Can you explain how the whole system works uh, between the universal margin, the sub accounts and the individual margin? Yeah, so honestly, I haven't appreciated quite how many people use isolated margin. So to me, isolated margin is pretty inefficient. It's not something that I personally would use in my trading. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of the bias, I have to take the blame. That's probably why... Isolated wasn't a massive 
priority for us in the first step. So like in our system, everything you trade kind of gets combined into one health score, we call it. So that, mm. that health number basically says how many dollars are you away from liquidation and how many dollars away are you from not being able to trade? You know, say so your initial health is $1,000. It means you got like $1,000 left to use for margin and trade with and do different things with. Our maintenance health number it might be $2,000 in this case. And it says, you are $2,000 away from starting a liquidation process. I.e., if you start to lose money, you're $2,000 away from getting to the point where our liquidators will kick in. Now, currently in our front end, we have it defaulted that you just trade out of one sub account. So that one sub account, everything in there is combined, you know, all your spot assets, anything you've borrowed, all your perk positions, they all contribute to your health and we liquidate or not depending on those positions and we allow you to take risk depending on those positions. We do have the ability to add more sub accounts. It's just not enabled on our front end yet. And really, if we start to do isolated margin, it really will be a version of that where basically we'll let you open a new sub account with one trade in it. That sub account sits on its own. You can manage it as one account all of its own sake. And then when you close the trade, we move the cash back. So mm. we need to set that up. It's, it, it's harder than it sounds, but... The ideal UX is that you just click a button, you open up an isolated trade, it magically does the stuff with the sub account in the background, and then it magically closes it again. That's kind of where we want to aim for. We just need to spend some time to build it. Okay. Uh, another point of differentiation for Vertex is about your uh, insurance fund, because decentralized platforms don't always have an insurance fund, but yours does. So yeah. maybe could you explain how it works and why you decided to, to set one up? Yeah, so... The insurance funds, we hope, are never really kin to use. If mm. we have used good levels of margining, i.e. we've built the system to be relatively safe, if we have very quick liquidation processes and everything's kind of motivated to work correctly, the insurance fund should never come into play. Now, that said, we have it as a backstop. So. Mm. What should happen is in the event that we start to liquidate sub accounts and we start to get to the point where a sub account is in liquidation, but it's also bankrupt, i.e. there's no more dollar value left. There's no, as we liquidate, there's no value left to pay off the other side of the trade. What we'll do is we'll start to social, we'll take that money from the insurance fund. So the insurance fund will be the thing that plugs the hole in the event of that liquidation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it's perfect. In the event that the insurance fund is drained, we end up socializing losses between winners and losers on the platform. Mm -hmm. Start to see like a mass bankruptcy and the insurance fund isn't enough to back it up. Yeah. At that point, you'll see like a socialization of that risk across all parties. So it's not ideal, but the idea is you never get to that situation, but we like to lay out the worst case now. Mm -hmm. People understand and, and this in this liquidation and insurance process is very common across a range of exchanges. But as you said, it's not it's not as common in decentralized exchanges. And what you can end up with is just people get socialized on loss without any buffer between them and the protocols. Process. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. It's not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, another subject is about the trading fees that are some of the most important criteria I think traders look at when they are choosing platforms. So yeah. could you explain your fee model and how does it compare to, to other competitors? Yeah, so we charge according to like making or taking. So mm -hmm. if you're making, you put a limit order on our book. If you take, you'll just cross and buy or sell against the orders that sit there. Currently, all maker orders are free, so zero, and taker orders range from two to four beeps, uh, depending on which product you're trading. But we don't do any volume incentives. So for anyone but the largest, largest traders, our fees should be super, super competitive. So if you're a retail trader trading on any platform, if you come and look at our fees, they should be way cheaper than what you get elsewhere. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. So we're talking of a DEX. So the idea is, like you said, to be decentralized. I think that for now, uh, your sequencer is currently centralized, but it will be decentralized in the future with the second version of the protocol. So maybe we could discuss a little about uh, your vision of the decentralization, uh, where you are today and uh, where you're heading to uh, for tomorrow, maybe. So how is your decentralized sequencer working for now and how would it work uh, later? Yeah, so currently we run the sequencer and that means that all the orders and processes come through into that sequencer. We run it in a Rust-based EVM environment and then we push it through to the chain. So it's a compromise we've made where if you want to optimize for high frequency traders, which eventually allows for better liquidity on your order books, which eventually gives a better UX for your customers. Mm -hmm. We decided that running the order book, i.e. taking low value place and cancellations and running them off chain makes sense because we could do that zero gas. At the point where we match, we transfer the trade on chain, which is where it's worth paying the high value of gas because you want to secure the place trade. And then all custody and all our risk rules and stuff are run on chain. So the kind of main parameters of everything is all defined by smart contract, kind of what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. But some of the kind of processes and calculations run off chain in this sequence that we run for now. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see that the things that made it go off chain are always probably going to exist unless we see some drastic reduction in gas costs, or maybe we go to our own custom L1, which is something we talk about. Mm -hmm. I think for now, where we are is plan for decentralizing the sequence. So we'll, we'll keep a similar model, but what we would do is run from a kind of, we'll have this concept of like a lead sequencer and then sort of guardians that watch it. These yeah. are all sequences that could do the same role, but be run by different parties who are chosen by social consensus. So basically we can use the DAO to choose a range of validators, probably in the range of like 10 to 20, not, we're not aiming for like Ethereum level mm -hmm. global decentralization of thousands and thousands of nodes. <laughs> But that should give enough decentralization where we have failover and you can also have trust in that lead so that you know that they're doing the right thing. For now, we're kind of operating on trust where we're the deployers of the contract. And then we've also been the ones who've built the sequencer. So users can trust us from that perspective. But the idea is we take ourselves out of the equation and build a kind of more trustless system. Could it really be just as fast as a single node? Because as you mentioned, Vertex is has a lot of speed. But if there were several nodes And as you said, not on the uh, like Ethereum, but just several nodes, they probably would have to communicate uh, before matching orders. So uh, would it increase the order matching times and would it be a problem for you? So I think what we would do is a kind of optimistic setup where that lead node matches orders. Yeah. But then it's gossiping the, like, the order of those things as they come into the other sequences. And if at any point they find a reason to challenge what's happening on that lead node, then we'll have a like slashing slash governance process arise. It should be something that never happens because if you put the penalty mm -hmm. action in place, everyone should operate yeah. in the correct way. But by doing it that way, we keep the speed because really you're just operating through a single node whilst the other ones act as kind of this guardian social consensus type of thing. It's, it's a similar setup to the one you see on Wormhole or other protocols. I think Arbitrum have a similar plan for decentralizing their sequencer. So it's a very like similar kind of thing. Right yeah, now. of course. And how do you plan to select the validators with, uh, like you said, new guardians? Yeah. At the moment, um, that's not a problem we're dealing with, but obviously we'd sort of be looking for pretty high quality partners that guarantee uptime, have a reputation for running. And I think we're aiming for something that's not like fundamentally, I think you'd, you'd probably be looking for teams that were more docs than not, mm -hmm. um, so that users have a sense of like who's doing what and who's running the validator. Yeah, of course. Okay, but like you said, not your top priority at the moment, of course. So. Our token launches in October. I would say as we start to decentralize governance, which is really what the token represents, we would look to decentralize the technology as well at the same time. So it's not top priority right now, but I would say that we're three to six months away where this becomes a 
serious effort for us on the engineering side. Okay, pretty clear. Yeah. Super. And do you have plan uh, on adding other unusual features to Vertex, like I don't know, copy trading or uh, things like that? And uh, uh, if yes, when would those new things come to frictions? Maybe, uh, I don't know, for a third version of the protocol? So. I think um, for now, anything like that, so copy trading, like yield farming vaults, mm. I don't know, some of these like governance supercharger protocols, I view a lot of that as like non-core technology. Mm -hmm. It's kind of non-core to our product. Our core product is spot and perp trading at super high performance, at super low fees. That, yeah. That's really what we're trying to build is like really, really great liquidity and trading experience. So that being the case, I think our vision is that we'll have an ecosystem of projects that trade around us. And we, we already see that, you know, we're already partnering with people like Elixir, Really Good Vaults, DeFarm. There are others that we're lining up right now. Those projects will use our liquidity, build their own product, And I think for users, what you'll end up having is like a bunch of integrations we end up putting on the front end, depending on which is the best thing. They can just plug in. They don't really see it, but what they're really plugging into is someone else's product. Mm -hmm. And that for us, we can build way faster in parallel than we yeah. can trying to do it serially. I think for us, my main focus is get the main product built, which as I said, we'll probably have by October, then token and technology decentralization. And then really probably going like multi-chain and using tools like account abstraction to build something that looks as much like a centralized exchange as possible. Mm, that's interesting. Um, maybe just to discuss a little bit about the account abstraction. What do you think of that trend? And like you said, it's, uh, let's say, to be synthetic for the audience, with account abstraction, you can do things like, for example, uh, creating a wallet with a simple mail address or things like that, but on chain. Uh, wh what do you see in the future? Uh, like, uh, what type of application uh, will you be uh, going to implement in Vertex with the account abstraction things? I mean, account abstraction unlocks so many things that I'm still trying to like figure out, and my team the same. We're still trying to figure out what are all the things we could do with it. Yeah, because um, it's an immensely powerful tool. I think you know a really easy example you laid up there is we could make it so for a user they feel that they come to us, they set up a Vertex account with an email and they've got the login, but in the background, it's done all the private key stuff. It's set up the account for them. It's totally removed away from us so they know it's safe. And then if they want to move that, they can. You know, at the same time, like it's not attached to Vertex forever. They can take that and go and do other things with it. Yeah, that is such a huge leap relative to, you know, having your seed phrase and you've got to lock it away somewhere and, you know, <laughs> no social story. And if you're a newbie coming into this space on chain, even me, you know, I've been trading since 2004. I've been involved with technology projects since not long after. Dealing with wallet UX is horrible. Yeah, it's really awful. And so... Uh, I think account abstraction is going to be just, it's going to be like the layer that takes away all this scary wallet stuff and makes people way, way more confident about using crypto. And uh, how do you see, it? Uh, good question too, how do you see the, the adoption, more global and broad adoption of uh, cryptocurrencies and the web free technologies, if we can say uh, it like that, in the next uh, in the next year? It's really hard to see. It's been kind of a terrible two years for crypto. Uh, <laughs> yeah where centralized exchanges have eroded trust. Um, we've seen a lot of bad actors in the space. I think it feels like a lot of that more scammy stuff has kind of cleared out. And now what you have, if you look around, is a lot of serious teams trying to build really good technology projects. And so my hope is that the next round of adoption is a bit more organic. Mm -hmm. So we have some headwinds, you know, regulatory concerns in the US and elsewhere are problematic, I think, but I hope eventually welcome, like I they'll give some clarity and we can get to a place where we know where we stand and how to build things in the right way. But I think there's a genuine chance you see really big adoption from brands, teams that come in and say, oh, here's a way that we can use on-chain, provable, trustless ownership of assets as a way of doing business. And it will unlock various kind of business cases. But for now, it's like a bunch of people trading frog coins and shorting JPEGs and 
yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe more specifically on the DEX market, uh, what do you think of this current DEX market? Where do you think uh, Vertex stands in it currently? And I, I don't know, uh, maybe what's your favorite DEX over than Vertex, if I can, uh, if I can yeah. ask? So I think it's a really interesting time. You can kind of see that the DEX market, people talk about derivatives a lot. Like everyone talks about different perp DEXs, you know, GMX, UIDX. And the reason is crypto is still just a, it's really a trading space, right? People want to trade, they want leverage. And now that all these centralized exchange problems happen, people want to move on chain more and more, which I think is great, right? Mm -hmm. But now what we've got is two different models. You've got the ones that are trying to build a alternative to a centralized exchange. So they genuinely want to build something that can be a centralized exchange, but be decentralized. Yep. I think DYDX is the biggest version of that right now. I think we are in that same category. And okay. that's kind of where I want us to. The other one is these kind of PVP uh, or like player versus pool type models. It's not really PVP, player versus pool. You trade against the protocol. They tend to have very high fees, but they'll offer like super high leverage. So you've got your GMX, you've got Quenta, and then probably like one of the most extreme versions that's like a roll bit. Yeah. I think the problem with those is they, they tend to be very expensive for the end user. And so, and but they're quite simple, quite easy to use, but they tend to have more of a like casino mentality. You're rolling the dice, you bet against the house, the house has an edge, which is the yield and the fees. And you tend to on balance lose, but it's fun because you mm. can do a thousand X bet, a hundred X bet. More, uh, more something like casino approach directly than, uh, than yeah. trading approach, yeah. I mean, Rollbit has taken that to the nth degree, right? They, they do very much a casino. Approach. I think for me, the leader in the space or the one who's like kind of innovated the way and, you know, I have a lot of admiration for probably DYDX. Um, I think their current commitment to moving to Cosmos is super interesting. I will observe it with bated breath for them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's very challenging what they're trying to do. But yeah, I, I think that's a good example of someone who's done a great job of building something that has compromised but then compromises in a smart way to produce a nice ux for their users yeah got it um maybe a less specific question i saw that you have an ambassador program maybe you could tell us uh, what it is about and uh, how to get in if some people that are listening to us today uh, maybe want to, to learn more oh the ambassador program yeah we yeah. have a range of users who are active in the community, they understand our product, they help us educate other users, new users. Some of them are involved on helping us run our Discord. Some of them help respond to problems on Telegram. And they're just like a super engaged set of users that are involved in the protocol. Anyone can apply. I believe you can go in via uh, our website, but just reach out in Twitter DMs or reach out in our Discord and they'll be able to tell you more about how to join the program. Super. Uh, another question about maybe your, let's say your hiring politic. Are you hiring at the moment? So we're not actively hiring at the moment. We kind of have a bit of a weird rule. We're always looking for like really good people. If we come mm -hmm. across anyone who's a killer in a certain area, you know, look, we're going to work hard to see if we make that person part of our team. So we're always hiring, but I'm also not actively hiring, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah, we're always looking for good engineers, really, is probably the main place where we always need people. Okay, super. Maybe your last question, more classical to finish this interview. Do you have a little message for the French community listening to us today? Uh, I'm trying to dig up my uh, schoolboy French. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> Do I have a main message? I think the main thing for us is that the um, our token program is really early. And so it's an incentive for users to come use the program, help us understand what we need to change and build. And so anyone that's looking to get involved, I would just go and look at our site, see if you like how you are, deposit some small funds, start trading. If you like it, you can kind of see how many rewards you've earned. That's like a really good opportunity to be early, become part of future governance uh, and have kind of a piece of the protocol. Yeah, super. We will give all the link in the description so people will will try it for sure. Super, Darius, thank you. I'm just switching back to the French to finish the episode. 
Thanks again. Euh, voilà, donc n'hésitez pas, euh, on va vous poser tous les liens utiles en description, à aller tester donc éventuellement Vertex, qui est donc est un, un nouveau DEX, vous l'aurez compris. Euh, merci à tous pour votre écoute. Si vous avez des questions supplémentaires, n'hésitez pas à les poser en commentaire. Hein, comme d'habitude, on y répond euh, rapidement. Voilà. Thank you, Darius, again for your time. It was really, really interesting. Merci. <laughs> Have a nice day. Au revoir. Au revoir.